Good evening. Good evening and welcome. My name is Stephen Tatum. I'm a professor of English and director of the Environmental Humanities Program in the College of Humanities here at the university, now in our fourth year uh, of operation on behalf of the program's faculty, students, and the College of Humanities, Dean Robert Newman. I'm pleased to welcome you to this first public lecture in our newly dedicated Carolyn Tanner Irish uh, building. It is also a distinct privilege for me to introduce our speaker this evening, David Abram, cultural ecologist, philosopher, founder and director of the Alliance for Wild Ethics, or AWE. Check out the website when you get a chance. And vis visiting scholar in the Environmental Humanities Program. In addition to his public talk this evening, they will, will be visiting both undergraduate and graduate classes and meeting uh, in individual and small group consultations this week to talk with students and faculty about issues uh, regarding language, cognition and perception, and of course, ecology. David studied at such places as Westland University, the Yale School of Forestry, and the State University of New York, where he received his doctorate in 1993. At one point in his education, one of his interests, sleight of hand magic, he studied in relation to psychotherapy under the guidance of R.D. Lang. Later, he traveled to Nepal and Indonesia. Those of you who read the opening chapter of The Spell of the Sensuous know this part of his life, uh, where he lived with and traded magic with uh, indigenous uh, sorcerers. A recipient of numerous awards, such as the Rockefeller Foundation grants, David has widely published essays and articles in the leading journals in a variety of fields. He's also given public lectures and conducted seminars at universities around this nation and uh, in other countries. To many in the room tonight, no doubt, he's best known as the author of The Spell of the Sensuous, Perception and Language in a More Than Human World, which received the Lannan Literary Award um, for nonfiction after its publication in 1996. He is now completing a second book entitled Becoming Animal, which will be published by Pantheon in 2009. As he remarks in the preface to The Spell of the Sensuous, his book's simple premise that's his words, is that we are human only in contact and conviviality with what is not human. In this book, David explores two central questions. How, which is to say by what stages and process Western civilization had come to be so deaf and blind to the vital existence of other species and to the animate landscape they inhabit. Secondly, how might it be possible to alleviate our individual and or collective estrangement from this animate earth to begin to recall ways of reestablishing the rootedness of human perception and language with the sensuous world in which we and our technologies are rooted. Informed by his deep immersion in the tradition of American nature writing, especially the examples of Carrie Snyder, Wendell Berry, and Henry David Thoreau, the oral traditions of indigenous peoples, and the European philosophical tradition of phenomenology. The spell of the sensuous traces a provocative path uh, toward re-inhabiting or recovering what he calls a genuinely ecological approach, one which strives to enter ever more deeply into the sensorial present to become ever more awake to the other lives, the other forms of sentience and sensibility that surround us in the open field of the present moment. The strong claim made by this theoretically informed, originally argued, and passionate risk-taking book is this. If we do not soon remember 
ourselves to our sensuous surroundings, if we do not reclaim our solidarity with the other sensibilities that inhabit and constitute those surroundings, then the cost of our human commonality may be our common extinction. As the title of this talk tonight suggests, The Earth's Wild Eloquence, Language and the Ecology of Perception, David will be extending these themes in this strong plane. <clears throat> Please welcome, join me in welcoming David Abram. But you folks have chosen to come out and um, reflect with me on some other matters of international and interspecies concern. Um, good. I want to thank very much Stephen Tatum, not just for his introduction, but all he's, uh, he's done to bring me here, and Robert Newman as well for his wonderful efforts on behalf of uh, getting me involved environmental humanities program here. Um, and also, the very scintillating folks that I've met. I've just been in town one day, and uh, I'm pretty impressed by the diversity of uh, cognitive styles, all of them very uh, playful and alive that I've encountered here at the university. Um, I think I want to start words of an old Inuit elder named Nalunjiak. Um, her words were recorded up in the far north uh, at the beginning of the last century by the great Scandinavian explorer, Knud Rasmussen. Um, he was talking to this old Inuit gal, and, and this was one of the things she said to him. In the very earliest time, when both people and animals lived on Earth, a person could become an animal if she wanted to, and an animal could become a human being. Sometimes they were people and sometimes animals, and there was no big difference. All spoke the same language. See, that was the point, that words were like language. A word spoken by chance might have strange consequences. It, it might suddenly Alive, and what people wanted to happen could happen. All you had to do was say it. Nobody could explain it. That's just the way it was. So, Nalunjiak's words um, speak about language and about animals and about a language that is shared by both humans and other animals. They speak of magic, and specifically word magic. These are the things that I'd like to touch upon this evening. And because tomorrow evening is the start of Yom Kippur, which is the holiest day of the year in the Jewish tradition, I might also try, uh, if I have time, to say something of relevance to the High Holy Days in the Jewish tradition as well. Um, and I would like to speak about perception, because perception, um, to my mind, is now by perception I mean the work of our senses, our eyes, our skin, our ears our nostrils, even our tongue, tasting the world. 
sensory perception, I would say, is the glue that binds our separate nervous systems into the encompassing ecosystem. I'll say it again. Sensory perception is the glue that binds our separate nervous systems into the enfolding ecosystem. And it's terribly important, and yet it's a, it's a phenomenon by and large, taken for granted in all our disciplines. Um, perception. Well, Nalunjiak's words, of course, are similar to statements made by the elders of many different indigenous peoples from other places around the world. Um, these words express a deeply animistic style of experience. Animism. Animism is the word that was coined by the early anthropologists at the end of the 19th century to name a style of perception, a particular mode of perception that seemed to be common to so many indigenous peoples, as diverse as such uh, peoples are, as weirdly different as indigenous traditions are from one another, they have this curious element in common, which is an inability, or I would say an unwillingness, to acknowledge any divide between that which is animate and that which is inanimate. Rather, for them, everything is animate. Everything moves just that some things move a lot slower than other things, like the ground. But it still moves. Everything moves. Now, let's remember that we all have our indigenous ancestry, whether it's two or three generations back in our lineage, or for some of our lineages, 20 generations back, or 30. Nonetheless, this is not something exotic for 95% of our tenure on this planet as homo sapiens, we all live as hunters, gatherers, foragers in a thoroughly animistic context. So by choosing the term animism, what the anthropologists at the, at the inauguration of the sort of field of ethnology we're trying to say is, hey, all of these peoples don't want to make a clear distinction between that which is animate and that which is inanimate. Everything moves. Everything is animate. So there are only these different styles or speeds of animateness, these different rates or rhythms of pulsation these many different ways of being alive. And a slab of granite has its own style, its own rhythm, its own interior animation. That, too, everything is alive. So it's not just um, you know, the other animals that dwell in our locale, the walking and crawling folks that migrate through this terrain or hang out here, and the flapping, screeching, feathered folk who squawk down on us as they swoop by overhead, and the thin peoples who swim in schools in the waters. Um, not just the animals, the birds, the fish, but also the rooted beings, trees, the oaks, the scrub maples, scrub oaks on your hillsides here, um, the aspen grove, these two are not just alive, but also, in some sense, sentient, feeling, awake beings, though in a very different manner than the way we are awake and aware. But not just the other animals and the plants and the grasses and the penstemons swaying in the wind, um, but also the rocks, the mountains, rivers, dry riverbeds. Lakes, 
the winds and the weather power, storm clouds, thunder, this too, everything is alive. Even words have their own life. Well, this style of experience, this animistic style of awareness, I want to suggest is very basic to the human animal, to the human organism. It's not something exotic. I want to suggest to you that this is our most basic, ordinary human way of encountering the world, of feeling the, the field of phenomena around us, the 10,000 things, the elemental earth, whatever the topography where you live, that it's alive through and through in many different ways. Um, that this is ordinary, that this is sort of baseline for the human animal. Because when we think about it, I mean, if you pay very close attention to, to the act of perception, even taking a single sense, the sense of touch, and you notice it's so easily taken for granted and overlooked, that the hand with which you explore the tactile surfaces of the world around you, or the, the, the texture of um, the bark of a tree that you might be feeling, or the smooth bark of, of an aspen, um, the very hand that explores the world's textures has its own textures and is itself entirely a part of the tactile feels that it feels its way through and explores it. So that, that when I reach out to touch that aspen tree and move my fingers along its smooth and slightly rippled surface, I'm not just touching the tree. I'm not just feeling the tree under my fingers. I'm also feeling myself touched by the tree. That is, there's this curious reversibility to the sense of touch. Touching uh, a lichen patch on a large boulder, I'm also feeling myself touched by the lichen. It is sometimes sampling the chemistry of my own uh, skin as I am touching it. This reciprocity that's there in the sense of touch also exists in other senses. Because the eyes with which we gaze out at the visible field and explore the colors of leaves and the blue of the sky or the white of the drifting clouds, these eyes are themselves visible. They are entirely a part of the visual field that they explore. Um, they have their own color, in my case, kind of a, a greenish brown, um, and their smooth, shiny surface, like the surface of a so when I wake up in the morning, where I live down in New Mexico, and rub my eyes awake and step outside to greet the day, and I gaze out at that forested hillside just opposite me, I'm not just seeing those pinon pines and junipers on that hillside. I'm also feeling myself exposed to that hillside. I feel myself visible to the hillside, I feel seen by that slope and by the rooted beings that inhabit that slope. Again, this reciprocity is basic to the act of perception. Gazing the world, we feel the world gazing back at us. Touching the world, we feel the world touching us. And that this is our most basic, ordinary way of experiencing things is attested by the discourse of so many indigenous traditions. Like the Koyukon people of central Alaska who say that they inhabit a forest of eyes, that all of these trees are gazing at them and are aware of them. And so they have to take great care how they move and what they do. 
or the Navajo people, the Diné people, as they call themselves, just south of here, who say things like, I must be humble in the face of these mountains. I must be humble in the face of these grasses. I must be humble in the face of the sky. All of these beings are looking at me. I must take care how I walk. But if I'm right that this is our most ordinary, sort of normal way of experiencing the world, that our senses left to themselves spontaneously experience the world as something that is alive through and through, how did we ever lose this basic experience of things? How did we ever break out of the sense that the sun and the moon itself was a being who draws prayers from us, and that the ground is actively supporting our steps as we walk upon it. So we have to take care how we walk, because it feels our footfalls as we walk. How did we break out of that kind of experience into a much more objective, somewhat dead or deadened world that most of us seem to and we might suspect that it has something to do with language, with the ways that we speak, because what we say has such a profound influence on what we see or hear or even taste of the things we are. There are ways of speaking, I think, that can open and enhance our sensory rapport and reciprocity with the rest of the sensuous world. But there are also ways of speaking that can stifle and inhibit the kinship between our sensing body and the sensuous earth. For instance, um, to take a sort of goofy example, but I grew up in Long Island, in New York, um, at a time when in high school, um, in high school biology, and I, I, I sort of had a, a yen for nature, and I was really excited to finally make it into the grade where we had um, a good, genuine biology class per year. And it was quite exciting um, for me, but I have to say this, as a, as a kid, I, we lived in the suburbs and in an area where there were lots of trees in our backyard, and lots of bird song and bird speech going back and forth between the branches of the trees and the ground where various uh, wingeds were conversing about this or that. And I grew up sort of sitting on the stoop or out on the lawn just trying to listen in to all of this speech and figure out you know, what are these folks saying to one another. Um, I didn't have a lot of success in that endeavor. but. In biology class, taught by Mr. Waracilla, we learned, I learned for the first time, that the behavior of other animals is programmed in their genes. And that's how it was taught to us, and that was the phrase. It's programmed in their genes. As though every other animal was a kind of automaton or robot, and someone had come and plugged in um, a particular software or a particular program that led various animals to act or behave the way they do. And the more I took on this way of speaking in order not just to understand the textbook, but to participate in the class, the oddest thing happened. Um, all of that uh, bird speech in the backyard sort of faded from my awareness. I just, I wasn't hearing all of that bird song anymore. In fact, I had a sense that there were fewer and fewer birds in the backyard. And I mentioned this to my folks, and they said, gee, they hadn't noticed any, any difference in the amount of bird life there. But I noticed, sitting there on the stoop, that it was only by making a big effort I could actually tune back in and notice again, yeah, there was a lot of bird speech, sounds coming from the various trees. But as soon as I stopped paying 
extra attention to it, you fade it into a kind of background because my ears had become so deaf to anything that didn't really speak in words. You see, I had defined away all of the meaning in those bird utterances. It was just programmed sound, um, like sort of nice music programmed on your iPod or playing in the background. But it wasn't a bunch of beings actively making meaning in the present moment for one another. It was automatic sound, just happening. And so there was no active generation. There was no creativity in that speech. And so my ears began to shut down to all of that. I couldn't hear it so easily. It's just one example. I, I was racking my mind this afternoon to think of, OK, a good example of this. That's one. How what we say so influences what we hear or see, or I would say, what we perceive of the world around us. Because we've got this odd notion in our culture that language is an exclusively human property or possession. And I wonder if this notion that we humans are the the real bearers of spoken meaning. Other birds, other animals, they make sounds, but it's not speech, because it's not carrying active, expressive meaning. That assumption is, I think, really good. I wonder what it does to our senses and to our sensory experience of the earth around us to think that language is our exclusively human possession. So I want to tell a story about something that happened to me um, a few years back when I was uh, traveling, actually, I found myself in the very peculiar position for someone like myself, being a naturalist in residence on a cruise ship, um, heading up to Alaska from um, um, southern Canada, from Vancouver. And I don't know why I accepted this gig, um, except that I'm an avid kayaker. Ocean kayaking is something, it's probably my favorite form of locomotion, apart from walking maybe. Um, but I'd often seen these floating, you know, behemoths, these giant ships out there in the distance. And I wondered what goes on in there. And so I was curious. Um, and when I was invited to take this engagement as, as the naturalist on this cruise, I sort of jumped at it without thinking. As soon as I found myself on the ship, was huge. There were 2,000 passengers and 900 members of the crew. It was a floating city. And someone like me is actually not very comfortable for long periods, more than a couple of hours, in um, crowds of other people. I'm much more at ease hanging out with the spiders in the, in the woods and you know, the squirrel and the deer. And there's not a lot of other animals on a cruise ship. Um, except in those platters of food that they endlessly bring out, uh, roasted animals of various kinds. Um, tasty, but it didn't do the trick, really. Um, and after a couple days, I was really freaking out. And looking over the railing of my stateroom, it's way down to the water. But I'm thinking, how am I going to get off of this thing? Uh, finally, after. Um, several days, the boat docked in the town of Juneau, Alaska, for a full day. And when they put down the gangplank, I ran running off down to the street and stuck out my thumb and hitched a ride north up the coast to a spot where the driver of the car suggested I might be able to bargain uh, for a kayak with the proprietor of this little uh, motel on the coast there, which I was able to do gave the guy five bucks, and he let me take his kayak, carried it down to the water's edge, put it there, climbed in, took the paddle, and shoved off into the water and began paddling out to sea into this glassy, open water. And it was so luminous. It was this ringing blue. Afternoon, clear and crisp.
crisp as a bell. It was like the sky was, was a giant bell, and, and the sun was the clapper in the bell. And the water was like glass, slightly shimmering like this. And the only sound in this silence was flish, flop. every now and then um, a water bird or two out of the distance like a cormorant would come sort of skimming just above the water's surface flapping and then would fade into the distance again and then just that glush glitch of the paddle blades and I was paddling into the center of this huge mandala of mountains because behind me were the snowy peaks of the coast range and many miles out there were the peaks of one of the great barrier islands in southern Alaska um, and also ice covered so it was a, really a ring of mountains and this mirrored surface between and closer to me just a few miles offshore were a couple smaller islands and I was paddling toward those drawing them closer it seemed with the paddle and as I got closer to them there was a dead snag on one island and there was a big bald eagle on um, the top branch of, of one of those and it was sort of gazing down at me and as I got closer it launched itself and soared off between these two islands and I just followed it between them paddling on this still fairly smooth surface bit of a breeze coming up between the two islands as I got out the other side of this channel I began to hear this weird sort of cacophonous sound uh, dark um, I couldn't place it sounded vaguely organic coming from down to my left to the south and I was curious, so I turned the paddle and began paddling down the back side of the southernmost of these two islands. And I came around a, a big bunch of rocks at the end of a cove, and the sound got louder in my ears. And it was very, um, yes, cacophonous, but low tone, and I still couldn't place it. And then I came into a broad bay, and I couldn't hear it anymore, just the sound of the, the paddle and the waves gently lapping on beach and I remember also the smell of the salt air as I came around another bunch of rocks at the end of that cove and saw that I was coming into the vicinity across the next bay of one of the very large sea lion colonies that are found in that part of Alaska uh, there was a lot of of sea lions all lollygagging out on these rocks that were sort of dwindling off into the water. And as I opened, you know, as I sort of paddled into the, the bay, I began counting these bodies. And I could see over 120 such folks. And these are big beings. They're not California sea lions. These are northern sea lions stellar sea lions, they call them. The bulls can be almost 12 feet in length. They're huge uh, folks. And they weren't making a lot of noise now as I was coming closer. But I realized this was the source of that noise I'd been hearing earlier. Now I'm just hearing them sort of snorting like that to one another as they're sort of shuffling around on the rocks. And I'm paddling the bay toward them and the sounds of their snorting are also opening up my nostrils because the the saltiness and this sort of smell of them this more biological smell reaching me across the surface of the water as well as the smell of the kelp beds and I was beginning to have to pull the kayak through was assailing my nostrils and sending certain zinging feelings up into my brain. 
And one, I got sort of about halfway across the bay, and one sea lion on my side of those rocks sort of got up on his front flippers and was leaning toward me, looking at me, sniffing the air, and then um, he started bellowing, barking, really. It, it sounded like this. And then a couple others near him, big bulls got up on their front flippers. And before you knew it, all of these sea lions were up on their flippers, roaring at me. Whoa! I put the paddle down, and I started doing something that I had learned in the backcountry years earlier. Um, actually, it's sort of north here um, in the greater Yellowstone. I'd been cross-country skiing and had come out of a clutch of trees and suddenly found myself looking face to face with the body of a, a mother moose. And she and I was just very close to her, maybe six feet from her, and she stomped her front feet into the ground. And one of her ears swiveled around backwards, and I saw that she had uh, a little moose behind her. And with her other ear, she's listening close to me. And it was very intense encounter, but my body spontaneously sort of relaxed as much as it could and started singing. I just, I made this sound. Ah, ah. And immediately, this mother moose just relaxed and went back to munching on the willows after me. And I thought, cool. And I just gliding past on my skis. So that's what I did. I started singing in the kayak. But if I had made such an innocuous sound as, ah, they wouldn't have heard me, because they were really loud and guttural. And so I started singing, but in the most guttural voice I could, low and, well, it sounded like, ah, ah, ah kayak, and immediately all the sea lions fell silent. And they started looking at each other, like this, and sniffing the air toward me and looking at one another. And I'm, arr, arr. And all the sea lions seemed sort of really fascinated and curious and, and looking at one another and really stretching toward me. And I stopped my guttural bellowing. And all I could then hear was all of their sniffing and snorting as I took up the paddle and began paddling, stupidly, I now know, um, closer and closer and pulling my way through these small beds and hearing these snorful sounds coming from the sea lions and remembering the smell of them my nervous system, through my nostrils, and the smell of the kelp. And I got to just about within 20 feet of those rocks when that same big bull sea lion on my side of the rocks got up on his front flippers, stretched toward me, and arr, 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 arr. and then two or three others immediately, arr, 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 and then all of them again, all up, arr, 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 arr. and it was, whoa. I had to stop and put down the paddle and realize, yikes, they are big, I'm real close, and I'm about to launch into my own guttural harangue when the water surface just between me and those sea lions starts roiling and swirling and bubbling, and then the bubbles are getting bigger and bigger, and then without any other warning, a back wheel bursts through the surface, this giant body, like flying the air, and then the wings I see are these dangling pectoral fins uh, from this immense form that then crashes down into the water surface, sort of half upside down, and this wave of water pours toward the kayak, over the kayak, and sweeps my paddle off, and I reach back and grab it, luckily, and then I'm gazing the head which is like the whole body of this being, it's all head, um, as it is slowly sort of slipping now 
down and further down and then under the surface. And it's gone. So I take the paddle and I start back paddling it. And then I think, you know, what are you doing, Abram? I'm thinking because you have no idea where the thing on the surface gets. I put the paddle down. I braced it against the sides of, of, of the boat, not knowing if is the whale going to upend me, what's going on. Um, and I'm just waiting, trying to stay calm. And sure enough, just a minute, you know, a minute and a half later, I start hearing these little pit, pit, bubbles bursting. And then they're larger, louder, coming now to my left. And then those bubbles are getting bigger and bigger still. And the water is just heaving upwards. And then <laughs> humpback whale bursts out. But this time, entirely parallel to the boat and sort of lunging forward. And the wave that rolls off of its flanks sideswipes the boat, almost flips it over. So I'm leaning back this way when the whale spouts. And the breeze blows it straight into my face. I'm already drenched. But then the fetid stench of its breath, whoo, sewage-like, I thought at first, you know? But then what a blessing to be inhaling the breath of a humpback whale as I'm gazing this depleted folds of its throat and this sort of weird, strangely shaped mouth slipping down. And then this eye that is oddly small and human-like for such an immense form, now slipping lower and lower as I'm gazing it, gazing me, gazing it, gazing me as it slips below the surface. And then I see the broad back of the whale. Two blowholes on the back. Next to one another. Like something you're not supposed to see. It's like, uh, and, and then it slipped immediately. And I didn't see. But I was left in the boat, shaking like this. I, I couldn't calm my body down. It was as if the great god of the deep had surfaced just between me and those sea lions, as if to say, not too close, mortal, to my kinsmen here. And so I'm trying to calm my shaking body down. And I glance over at those sea lions and realize with alarm that they have gotten so agitated by this visit from their god that they are starting to sort of all clamber down to the rock's edge and dive into the water, row after row of sea lions plunging into the water and then coming out of the water with their torsos and all of them surging straight toward me, bellowing, ar, 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 ar. whoa, and this is their medium water. I'm a stranger here. I can't, there's no way I could get out of the way in time. They are huge, massive beings, and there's a lot of them. And they're coming right at me. Arr, 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 arr. So my body, I don't know where it got the idea. I didn't, but my body just spontaneously started going in the kayak. My hands went up, and I started going like this in the kayak. And immediately, all of these sea lions who are racing toward me suddenly rear back and they all start following my hand. <laughs> so there I am like this and all these sea lions who had been, well, they're all of them in unison watching my hands like that. Amazing. So I brought my hands down to the paddle. As soon as I brought my hands down, arr, 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 arr. Whoa, I threw my hands up again and put them like this. And all the sea lions reared back, silent, and started following my hands again. And so there I was. <laughs> and by now, there is 80, 90 sea lions in the water in front of me, all of them, all together, you know, like a half submerged chorus line or something. And and so, sort of grinning at the sea lions and 
try to bring my hands down really quick like this. Arr, arr, arr. Okay, back up. They all are back. So I kept my hands there. And I kept them there. And I kept them there. And I'm thinking, interesting situation, Abram. How the fuck am I going to get out of this? <sighs> Holy shit. Well, I just kept my hands there. And I'm grinning at the sea lions. They're like, you know, they all have whiskers. So it's like I'm the conductor of this big whisker orchestra. And it's cool, except that my shoulders are getting really sore. And I'm realizing I may be a goner here. Um, but then I tried one thing. I just um, decided I'll rest one arm. And let's see if I can do that. And slowly, I just brought one arm down like this. And all the sea lions were still in front of me. So I kept my arm there. Oh, and I'm resting my right shoulder. And then I realized, my chance. So I start feeling around for the paddle, still looking them in the eyes, um, find it. And so I'm going to twist the kayak paddle around and then try to paddle my <laughs> way around the right side of this bunch of whisker faces. And as soon as I got enough off to the side of, their, of that big crowd, I grabbed the other side of the paddle and kept paddling hard um, and hard. And I didn't look back for about 15 minutes. And when I finally stole a glance back, yeah, there were a few of them following me, maybe 20, but at a nice, respectable distance and just with their noses sticking out like this. And I kept paddling, ultimately back to the place that I last saw just for the kayak. Well, there's something in that story about language, about a layer of language that we shared with all the other animals, a layer of language that we two-legged share with all the other animals. It is that sort of gestural, expressive layer of immediately felt meaning, where the meaning is right there in the sound that you make, in the way your body's moving, even just in the poise of that depth, the body itself speaks very directly. I mean, if I were to say something like this um, to you guys, ah, 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 you know, something like that, you don't have to look up in a dictionary to see what it means, right? Um, because your body gets it directly from my body without you having to think about it. But even someone from a very different culture and language, who doesn't speak English, would get most of the meaning of that, of that you know, uh, utterance. But even someone from a very different species will get much of the meaning. Because at that felt expressive layer of gestural meaning, language is shared, not just between us and the other animals, At that depth, everything speaks. Even the splashing speech of the waves on, on those rocks and the wind in the willows is itself a kind of a voice. The babbling speech of a brook. Uh, a few months ago, I woke up there in northern New Mexico. And as soon as I you know, sort of sat up in bed, something was here. And I didn't know what it was, but there was a, there was a quiet sort of grace had descended over my ears. And I didn't know what it was. And I, you know, I do every morning. I just sort of walked over and I opened the front door. I looked out and the big old apple tree, the main apple tree in this little orchard where I live, had just burst into blossom overnight, casting a kind of 
spell upon the whole place. These white blossoms everywhere. That tree was speaking to the space of color. And to me, it seemed, well, what I'm trying to say is that at that, that there is a depth of felt, immediate, bodily expressive meaning where, yes, it is right to say that we and all the other animals speak that language in common. Um, here's a chant from um, the Gabon Pygmy people. Part of the chant goes like this. They say, fish does, bird does, rock does, all lives, all dances, and all is loud. Fish does, bird does, mountain does, all live, all dances, and all is loud. Yeah, that's what I'm on about. But, well, what I'm trying to say too is that this is our oldest, most originary way of experiencing language as something that is shared in common with all the other beings, and that this is our oldest, most basic way of experiencing meaning and linguistic meaning, is found in the discourse of every indigenous culture that we encounter. Again, as weirdly diverse as these cultures are from one another, when we consult the elders, whether we're speaking of the Hopi culture of the Southwest Desert or the Pueblo peoples near where I live, or the Koyakon of Central Alaska, or the Haida of the Northwest Coast, or the Lakota of the Plains, or the Warani people and the Kayapo of the Amazon, or the Pintupi and the Pichantajara of Australia, or the Ogoni people of Nigeria, or the Sami people of Northern Scandinavia. All of these cultures, you ask the persons of high degree in these cultures, the elders, about their language, and they will say, well, the coherence of the language we speak is inseparable from the coherence of the surrounding landscape. Because for these people, the expressive vitality of the earth itself is the foundation of language. Language is the voice of the animate earth itself. It's the earth that speaks, and human speech is just our part of this much broader conversation always going on between beings. But if this is true, then how, again, did we ever lose it? How did we ever lose this sense of the world not just as alive and animate, but as expressly speaking and calling forth prayers and praises from us in conversation speech of the things around us. How did we ever lose that sensibility? In the absence of any formal system of writing, without any formalized writing system that is public in the spoken language as our writing system, they are cultures without And so we might wonder, what is it that writing does to our senses and to our sensory experience of the earth around us? And what is it that writing does to our experience of language and linguistic meaning? Interesting question. And again, the answers are complex. It's like a vast sort of interconnected spider web of threads follow, but I just want to pluck a couple of these threads in the time we have left. And by sort of plucking them, you can maybe feel the whole web vibrate and get a sense of what, what I'm trying to invoke here. Um, so first thread of the two I want to touch on tonight. How, in a culture without writing, is knowledge preserved? I mean, it's 
specifically the linguistically encoded knowledge uh, from one's ancestors, the knowledge gathered over millennia of how to survive in this land without destroying the land and how to get along with one another and where to find particular plants that are good for healing cramps and other plants that are good for curing sleeplessness except certain parts of the plant are toxic and how to detoxify them and which plants are good to eat if you prepare them in what ways and where to find particular animals and track them and which parts of the animals you want to prepare for skins and how to, all of that knowledge, how is that preserved in a culture without books? Because for us, we want to know anything. Now, we just, you know, go find the right book or now we Google it. But for, um, for so long in the West, you just find the right text and you look it up find what you want to know. But when there's no text, neither on the screen nor even on the page, how is that knowledge preserved and handed down? Anybody? Stories. Shuls. Stories. And songs. Poems, which are basically the same thing as songs. They're rhythm parts of stories that break into rhythm now and then when there's really crucial apple a day keeps the doctor away is a lot easier to remember than you know, having a piece of fruit every 24 hours is useful for not having to visit the physician. Um, a, a rhyme is real useful and oral peoples are peoples of rhythm and chant and chanted stories. They are storytellers. And stories for an oral culture are living encyclopedia. All of that ancestrally accumulated knowledge is held in stories. But the question remains, how are the stories remembered? How is it that the stories are remembered if they hold all this information? And that, curiously, has not been so well understood until recently. Because it was just assumed that the stories are told all the time, and you grow up hearing all these stories. But believe me, there are a lot of them. You know what? They're not told all the time. The most important stories, the sacred stories that carry the most key teaching, are told rarely, usually only in one particular time of the year. You know, here in North America, most of the, the key teaching stories are only spoken during the winter when most of the animals are asleep, so they don't you know, get insulted or freaked out when you hear them talking about them. Um, but the stories are told only in specific times. Story cycles are told, some of them not every year, but every five years. In Indonesia, I was present at the re recitation of a story cycle that is told once every 100 years. How do they remember it? Um, well, here's the key thing. Um, the stories are remembered by being associated with particular uh, elemental aspects of the surrounding landscape. For instance, key is that the stories often have other animals as central characters within the story. You know, coyote, or raven, um, and when you come upon the tracks of coyote as you go about your work gathering particular foods, it keeps triggering the memory of the stories in which coyote figures as a central character. Or a bear. Or eagle. Crow. Um, that is, the other animals being central in the stories figure as these sort of memory triggers. But much more central and important than that is the fact that the stories are associated with particular sites in the surrounding landscape where those stories happen or where the events in those stories are believed to have happened. And when you come upon that particular cluster of rocks or that forest edge 
or that cliff mountainside, that cliff edge of the mountain, it triggers the memory of the storied events that happened there. Because the land is the primary mnemonic or memory trigger for remembering the oral tale. The primary mnemonic. So as an example, um, my colleague, the American poet Gary Snyder, was traveling in Australia. He was visiting Australia some years ago and uh, was in the outback visiting some of the aboriginal peoples. And he was traveling one day in the outback in a pickup truck being driven by an old aboriginal elder, uh, uh, Intubi elder, I believe, named Grandfather Jimmy, Jimmy Chungarayi. And Jimmy is driving the pickup as he's also telling Gary some of the um, old dream time stories uh, that are central to his people. So he's telling Gary a story about the wallaby women who were going along and they came to that place over there where they bumped into some of the green ant people and they got into a big fight and the green ants went running up onto that hill over there where ooh, they encountered some of the crocodile women and some fornication happened and so the crocodiles came running down and the green ants were he's telling the story so fast that Gary couldn't keep up with him and he wants him to slow down, slow down so he can follow the story until suddenly walking, but they're riding in a pickup through the outback, and so they're passing each of the places where these stories happen very quickly. That is to say, the intimacy between language and the land in a traditionally oral culture is so intense that you have to pace the speed of your speaking to the speed at which you're moving through the terrain. Another example from the same continent. Um, again in a pickup truck, um, but this time the elder is sitting in the back on the flatbed of the pickup next to uh, an Australian poet named um, Billy Marshall Stone King who happens to have a tape recorder. And so he's tape recording the interchange and what this old man is telling him. And this is what he records. This old man says, see there, that tree is a digging stick left by the giant woman who was looking for honey ants. That rock, a dingo's nose. Ooh, there on that mountain is the footprint left by Changara on his way to Ulambura. Here, the rock hole of Warnampi, very dangerous. And the cave where the Nyi Nyi women escaped the anger of Marapulpa, the spider. Oh, ho, ho. Wati Kuchara, the two brothers, they traveled this way. There, you can see, one was tired from too much lovemaking, the mark of his penis dragging on the ground. Here, the bodies of the honey ant men, where they crawled from the sand. No, they are not dead. They keep coming from the ground, moving toward the water at Warumpi. It has been like this for many years. The dreaming does not end. It is not like the white man's way. What happened once happens again, and again, and again. This is the law. This is the power of our stories. Through the story, we keep everything alive. Through the places, these stories keep us alive. So to get a sense of what it's like to live in a storied land where every creek bed and cluster of rocks is sprouting with tales that happened there or how that mountain came to have that shape because anteater came and laid down just in that spot. And this big lake here, that's where, uh, you know, old woman came and urinated. And that's why that lake is there that we all swim in. I mean, that's the way the land used to feel all around this earth. It was alive with story. Except, you see, that when writing first comes into such a culture, and the stories that were once sort of sort of 
poking out of, sprouting out of every cluster of rocks and weeds and, and bunch of trees now begin to be written down. So now the inked traces made by the pen as it traverses the page begin to replace the tracks made by the animal and by one's animal ancestors as they moved across the land. Now the page becomes the primary mnemonic or memory trigger for remembering the oral tales and all the information in those stories. And the land, well, we don't need the land now because the knowledge is on the page. And now those stories can be read in distant cities and even on distant continents. And all the place-specific knowledge that is carried in those stories begins to be forgotten. So we open up a book of Grimm's fairy tales or Russian folk tales, and maybe we read about, you know, the wee people who lived under the mushrooms, and we think, wow, little people, what an amazing imagination those unlettered peasants had. But if we still lived out on that land, and, you know, our grandmother was still tugging us out, you know, come on, David, come on, look at that, look at that beauty there. Do you see that wee one there? Oh, he's a wise one. What are you talking about, Grandma? Just look there. Look under that toad stool. Yeah, there he comes. Oh, yeah. You look at him. And then you see Slugman slowly sliding out from under the mushroom. And you begin to realize that these stories are about real beings. And they carry real information about what really goes on in these hills. And out in the land itself, as all of those stories have been stripped off of the clumped trees and the clustered rocks and the dry creek beds and planted on paper, well, the land begins to feel bereft, superfluous, really, to the act of thinking. You no longer need to see those places. so we think we don't need them in order to think. But you might understand a little better now the destitution of so many of our indigenous brothers and sisters when a traditionally oral people is shoved out of its ancestral homeland, maybe because we want to clear cut the forests on their island in Indonesia. So let's move them to another island we want to do a new hydroelectric dam project. And so let's move the Creek people out of their homeland in Canada into some adjacent land, since theirs are going to be flooded. But to push a traditionally oral people out of their ancestral terrain is tantamount to pushing them out of their mind. Because the land is the very matrix of linguistic meaning for a deeply oral you need the land to think. OK. That's one clue. And the other that I'll pluck before winding up here is just this. In a culture without writing, language is primarily, well, human language anyway. Uh, is primarily speech. It's what I'm doing up here. Speech is generally taken to be shaped breath. Because I don't know if you noticed, but we only speak when we're breathing out. You know, in order to speak, you have to inhale some of this invisible substance around us and then breathe it out. And as you breathe it out, you let it sort of Slap your tongue and you shape it with your palate and um, let it ride out into the world. Uh, maybe it vibrates a few chords in your throat and you send it out into the world. And the assumption is that it is the breath that is carrying my words to your ears or your words to my ears. But it's true. We 
only speak when we're breathing out. In this culture, anyway, it's hard to speak when you're breathing in. It doesn't smell very good. We talk on the out breath. And it's the breath that is carrying my words out into your ears and your laughter to my ears. So the breath, which is the air, which is the wind, this invisible medium we are bodily immersed in, is assumed to be the intermediary in all communication between people and between people and the land, between other animals and between other animals and plants between bumblebees and the blossoms that draw them close. What is the medium of communication? It's the air. It's the medium that we live with is the mystery of mysteries to any deeply oral culture. Because they're unable to forget the air. The air is, is so intense and so magical presence. It's mysterious and magical because we can't see it. We can see it lofting the clouds. We can see it bending the grasses and bending the branches of trees. We can see it moving many things in the landscape. And we see that we ourselves cannot think a single thought without continually imbibing this invisible substance. So how do we know that it's not also moving our own thoughts? That our mind and our reflections are not being moved by the air itself. So for the Diné people of the southwest of, of North America, the Diné or the Navajo, as they're also called, um, as one example, their most cosmological, really sort of monotheistic power is called milti, milti, which means the holy wind. And the holy wind is what gives all things life and breath and awareness. Everything that partakes of the air is a wind. Holy wind or milti moves all things, and you cannot see it, but you can see it by the patterns that it leaves. It, it, wherever it goes, you find these sort of spiraling patterns or tracks or traces, little whirlwind patterns. So the spirals in our fingertips that we call our fingerprints, the Navajo chanters say that um, that's how we know that there are 10 little And the spirals in our toe tips are where 10 little winds entered into our toes when we were born. And the winds in our toes hold us to the ground. And the winds in our fingertips hold us to the sky. And that's why we don't fall down when we're walking. But there are also these spiraling patterns in the folds of our ears, in our ear folds. And that's how we know that there are two little winds hanging out in each of our ears, winds children. When we're thinking thoughts, when you hear that chatter of words inside your head, sometimes when you don't want to be thinking and it's just going on and on, well, the Navajo elders say, that's just Wynn's children talking to you from inside your ears. That's why you hear it. But these winds are just messengers or children of the winds of the four directions who themselves are subsidiaries of the big body of Milti, the holy wind, which gives everything its awareness. So in this notion, our thoughts are being thunk by the wind. I mean, this is a notion of mind very different from that to which most of us have been The Diné elders would agree, yes, there is something interior about the mind or the psyche. It, it does have an interiority to it, but it's not because it's inside your head. So I have a little mind inside my head, and you have a little mind inside your head. No, the interiority of the mind 
results from the fact that we are inside of it. We are inside it, along with all the other animals and the plants and the drifting clouds. We are alive within the vast intelligence of mind and soul, the will. It is not ours, it's hers. It's a sense here of mind or psyche, not as that which separates us humans from the rest of the landscape, because we've got intelligence and they don't. Certainly the rocks don't, the mountains don't. But this is a notion of mind precisely of that which connects us to everything in the landscape. Mind as we. And this notion of mind as wind or wind as mind can seem ludicrous to us, just bizarre, goofy, until we notice the evidence in our own words how, for instance, our word spirit comes, of course, from the same root as the word respiration. The Latin word spirit, spiritus, which means a breath or a gust of wind. That's what the spirit was. For so long, even in Europe, it was the wind, the breath, or the word psyche from which we get psychology and psychiatry, eco-psychology. Where does that word come from? Old Greek word, psyche. The verb psykein, psykein meant to breathe or to blow like the wind. And the noun of psyche or psyche is a gust of wind or a breath. Or the word anima, the Latin word for the soul which um, you know, gives us unanimous, being of one mind or one soul, or an animal, which is a being of soul, uh, or a breathing being, really. Being that breathes, because anima originally meant a breath or a gust of wind. Um, even such a scientifically respectable word as atmosphere, where does that come from? Anyone know the old root of that? Sanskrit, atmos, it's the same as the Sanskrit word atman, which means soul. But the original term atmos meant the soul which is the air, the air which is the soul. In fact, if you take the words for mind or spirit, psyche, in any language and trace them back to their oral origin, will find at least one of them that names the air as the very body of that mystery we call mind, or soul, or spirit. And so finally, just so I don't sound like some Native American wannabe up here, uh, let me just tell you a tiny bit from my own indigenous tradition, which is the Jewish tradition, um, because we are now what our tradition calls the days of awe, uh, the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and Yom Kippur, uh, which begins tomorrow evening at sundown. Uh, and it is the most sacred time in our tradition. Well, in the, the Hebrew language, in the Jewish tradition, we too have a word that means spirit and wind inseparably as the same very sacred term in our tradition. Um, it's sometimes translated as rushing spirit. And it's a holy word. It's there in the very first sentence of the Hebrew Bible. The world was without form and void, and a wind of God moved over the water. A ruach of God moved over the water. It is sacred because it, it names the very presence of the divine in the body's world. It is the very presence of the holy in the sensuous world. And it is so sacred because it's invisible. We can't see it, yet we feel it. We can feel it on our skin, caressing our face, or our fingers.
fingertips as it gusts past us, even when we're driving in the car and we hold our hand outside the window. That invisible spirit, that is ruach, rushing spirit. It, it's sacred, but it is not the most sacred word in our tradition. That would be the four-letter name of God. The four-letter name, or what the Greeks called the tetragrammaton. The four-letter name of God in Hebrew, which is spelt, the Hebrew letters are Yud, He, Vav, He. Um, in our alphabet, because our alphabet derives from that, Aleph, He, um, the letters would be Y, H, W, H. And we've all heard this pronounced as Yahweh, but that's not right, and it's illegitimate. Because the pronunciation of this name, which is much, which is so holy, um, well, we don't really know how it's pronounced. Because it's a secret, which is the secret and sacred are the same word, um, obviously. But the fact is, we forgot how to pronounce it. Because there's no vowels. The vowels aren't written in the name. Y-H-W-H. We just wrote the consonants, which is kind of odd. Why didn't you write the vowels? Well, because you see in, in Hebrew, and in the Hebrew Aleph Beit, which is as close as we can get to the earliest Semitic innovation that is the origin of all alphabets, including the Roman alphabet that we use today. Um, in the he Semitic Aleph Beit, there are no vowels. We just don't write the vowels. We only write the consonants. And you have to, as the reader, add your breath to those bones to make them come alive and begin to speak. And the way you add your breath to those consonants will be different if you, like in English, if you saw the letter R and D without a vowel there, you could read it as ride or road or rude or red. And so you can sing up the text differently each time you come to it. I mean, this is why. Judaism is a culture of argument because there, the, there is no fundamental one reading of the text. It is polyvalent, multivocal. It speaks differently each time you come to it. And you have to argue it out to figure out what is the Torah trying to say to us today because we didn't write down the vowels. The vowels are the breath because the breath is so sacred. So with that in mind, if we look back at that most holy name of God in the Western tradition, the Y-H-W-H. And we think, well, OK, no vowels, but let's meditate upon these letters as the Kabbalists do. This is a deep, old Kabbalist tradition, just contemplating of the olive tree, and the letters that make up the name, the most holy name of God. You notice this weird thing, if you sit with it for a few weeks and a few months, it'll suddenly hit you that the consonants that make up this name are the most breath-like consonants in any alphabet. Y, H, W, H. Y, H, W, and then the H repeats itself. Breath-like consonants. And if you meditate upon that for a few more years, it may then suddenly strike you like a fist in your face that, of course, there is a magic to the pronunciation of this name, and that it sounds nothing like the way you that to say the most holy name of God in our tradition, to say it rightly, probably sounds something like this.
that the most sacred name of the divine in the Western tradition is the name we all speak whenever we're conscious of our breathing. This ceaseless rocking in and out of ourselves that binds the invisible depths within us to the unseen depths around us that are lofting those clouds and to the interior lungs of a swallow sweeping by, to the grasses and the ocean soil. We are of one mind. So I think I'll close here with a short poem by Rainer Maria Rilke. It goes like this. Ah, not to be cut off, not through the slightest partition, shut out from the law of the star. The inner, what is it if not intensified sky? Curls through with birds and deep with the wind. Ah, not to be cut off through the slightest partition shut out from the law of.